The year was 2012. Barack Obama had just won a second term as the first black president of the United States. Captain Francesco Scatino crashed the coast of Concordia into a Tuscan island, resulting in the most catastrophic maritime disaster of the 21st century. And a corporatist gaming journalist with a man crush for Hideo Kojima earned the moniker, the Dorito Pope. How did we get here? Well, to understand just how important this event was at the time, and for gaming more generally moving forward, we need to take a much closer look at this man, Jeff Keighley. Okay, but not like a closer look like that. We're gonna like look at his, you know what I mean. Jeff's career started in a disconnected way in 1994, when at the age of 14, he was hired as a quote, interactive product specialist, end quote, for the Cybermania 1994 Ultimate Gamer Awards, which was to be the first televised video game award show ever. According to him, he was brought in to write some of the descriptions of different games that were nominated for awards at the show. Apparently, they felt that teenagers were better suited to write for the show than adult professionals, but regardless, Jeff was entranced. The show, while extremely awkward and bizarre, epitomized everything that Jeff loved. Random musical performances, lots of game trailers, and many, many commercials. Seriously, I'll include a link to the whole show from 1994. It's still on YouTube to this day. Watch it and it will explain so much. It's amazing. It's like an acid trip into Jeff Keighley's mind. It's phenomenal. I shared it on our Discord, links in the description by the way, and everybody agreed it's pretty uncanny. That being said, Jeff decided that day that he wanted to work in the video game industry and that his life's goal was going to be fulfilling the mission of Cybermania. He was going to make the ultimate award show to appreciate and laud the best games that release every year. Effectively, he wanted to make the gaming industry's Oscars. Fuck the Oscars, you know? For the next 20 years, Jeff worked hard, climbing the ladders of several gaming journalism publications, and he eventually found himself conducting major interviews of industry executives, running E3 coverage for major corporations, and eventually even running the Games Media Awards, or the GMAs. He also did a lot of work for G4 until it shriveled up and died, only to be reincarnated recently, and also he worked with Spike TV. All of this to say, Jeff was at his peak in 2012. He was a multimillionaire, famous, and he had built countless relationships with industry heads that he would use for years to come. What could possibly go wrong? Well, Jeff decided to give an interview to Levelsave.com in October of 2012. It was to be a quick interview that ran through Jeff's thoughts on the industry, the Spike TV Video Game Awards, which he was scheduled to run and oversee as an executive producer in just a few short weeks, E3, Comic Con, and Halo 4. But the moment that the footage began, gamers eager to see what their industry darling had to say noticed something quite aggressive. Enjoy. I'm assuming you've played Halo 4. I have played Halo 4, you are correct. So do you think it is a good thing that game, that food companies have started doing these things where they allow you to eat their product and go to the next level with their game? Or is yeah. that something you'd frown upon? Well, I, I'd look at it from a macro level in that, you know, for a long time movies have always had all these promotional partners um, tied to their releases and I think games haven't and you know one of the things that I've always believed in is that games need to become even more mainstream I mean guys like you and I play them but still you know the, the mass acceptance of how big gaming is is not fully appreciated and one way one conduit to sort of uh, reach that level of sort of attention is by brand partnerships and Mountain Dew has you know, had a, a long kind of standing partnership with the game industry uh, stemming back to, I, th I think Halo 3 was the first thing back in 2007 where they had you know, a big partnership um, with Microsoft around that. And you know, what I love about this partnership and why I'm excited about it is that it's, it, they're really adding value to the equation in that you know, gamers actually get value out of this. So it's not just you know, uh, you know, a, a logo slapped on a bottle. It really is you know, a meaningful uh, partnership where if you, you, know, you buy Mountain Dew or you buy Doritos, you actually get a code, which then you go to the website like DoXP or DoritosXP.com, you enter that code and link it to your gamer tag and you actually get experience in the game. It's, it's a win for the gamer too. 
After this video launched, all hell broke loose. What initially seemed to be nothing more than a sponsored interview segment quickly became the quintessential image of what gaming journalism had become. YouTubers and other media pundits alike united in their criticism of Jeff, but more broadly of what this interview, and in turn Jeff Keighley himself, represented in the industry. Now, I want to be clear. I don't blame Jeff for taking sponsorships. I do it myself all the time. In fact, I have a sponsor for this video, which we'll discuss towards the end. Sponsorships are a phenomenal tool in any public figure's repertoire, but there are some situations when they are simply inappropriate. And that distinction is what was at the heart of this outrage. You see, Jeff presented himself through the 2000s and the early 2010s as a journalist. Journalists are supposed to be objective, critical, and unyielding to outside pressures. A fantastic example would be somebody like Jason Schreier. The Bloomberg reporter and best-selling author is responsible for many of the most groundbreaking and shaking exposés that have been written in recent memory within our industry. As a result of his writings, he's received online hate, targeted harassment campaigns directed at him and his family, and according to his Twitter page, he's even been blacklisted by select publishers such as Bethesda for reports that he's written. Simply, he doesn't hold punches, and he deals with the consequences that result from that methodology. Jeff here is the polar opposite character. His entire career has been about building relationships, rubbing elbows with marketing executives, meeting celebrities, and enriching himself along the way. And there's nothing wrong with that. Self-enrichment is something literally everybody should strive to achieve themselves. But the problem is that if you take money to say certain things about games you're supposed to be objective and critically covering, you lose all credibility. This interview was the moment that the industry felt a seismic shift. For a decade, gaming had slowly been turning into a viciously monetized, pandering, poster board for neck-bearded gamer stereotypes. There was no sponsored segment that was too aggressive, and it seemed that there wasn't a single solitary journalist that couldn't be paid off to talk about some upcoming release. The expectation was that if a so-called journalist did a sponsored segment surrounded by Doritos and Mountain Dew, gamers were supposed to look at that critically and evaluate the claims made themselves, which obviously everybody should do all the time. But the point raised by industry figures such as Angry Joe in this video recapping the largest controversies of 2012 in the gaming industry was that journalists just shouldn't be doing this type of thing. It's fine if you're an influencer and take money to shamelessly promote things, so long as it's clear that that's what you're doing. After all, we all have to make a living somehow, and so long as viewers are willing to tolerate advertisements such that they can support the creators they enjoy, I see no issue with influencers doing sponsored segments like this one. And most gamers don't have an issue with this either. As proof, look at the top Twitch streamers today. Effectively, every single one of them is sponsored by huge corporations that they talk up extensively and promote incessantly. It's just part of being a public figure who's trying to capitalize on the fame and success that it's taken years to build. But it wasn't just Jeff's interview that sparked all of this controversy. There were other issues as well, such as an event at the Games Media Awards, where gaming journalists were encouraged to tweet out with hashtags promoting certain games and products in exchange for entry into a raffle to win a PlayStation 3. Needless to say, the idea that those in the industry who are supposed to be the most objective and critical were talking up products they had never experienced themselves in exchange for quick enrichment was a perfect encapsulation of what the industry had become. So-called gaming journalists weren't actually journalists at all. Most of them were simply public figures who talked up video games while only a few select refused to participate in such corrupting events and promotions. Maybe it was that people were calling themselves journalists who shouldn't have been calling themselves that. Maybe it was something as simple as that and it was plainly a misunderstanding. But at the end of the day, if you present yourself as a journalist, you're going to be held to that standard. 
But as with all social movements, there were a lot of externalities to the initial outrage that Jeff endured. Several notable female industry figures received hate and rage as a result of this industry reckoning that triggered in the fall of 2012. Shortly after the Dorito Gate debacle came onto the scene, a man by the name of Rob Florence wrote an article for Eurogamer, wherein he broke down the scandal in addition to bringing up other topics that were in the same vein, such as quoting publicly posted tweets by journalists such as Lauren Wainwright, where they openly defended the practice of giving away PlayStation 3s to journalists at the Games Media Awards, which pretty transparently, was an act of publishers and major companies within the industry giving away swag in exchange for favorable coverage, especially when you consider that the only way they could enter the giveaway for the PlayStation was if they sent out publicly a tweet that talked up a game. In response, Lauren Wainwright threatened legal action against Florence and Eurogamer, effectively claiming that they had libeled her. So Eurogamer quickly edited the article, trying to avoid any sort of legal action whatsoever, but this started another wave of online outrage. Eurogamer had chickened out and refused to stand behind its writer. Florence quickly resigned from the site because he was so disgusted at their lack of resilience, and Lauren received much hate, especially as she continued on defending these practices and was caught in multiple lies shortly thereafter. Readers then discovered that Lauren had actual consulting work for Square Enix on her resume and a Tomb Raider themed Twitter background. When pressed, she quickly edited the resume and protected her tweets, saying that she only consulted and never reviewed anything by them which again was proven wrong with her review of Deus Ex in the Sun. The threat of legal action and the defense by many of the practice show clear signs of how many games journalists in the UK and even the US may have just lost their way and are in it for the wrong reasons. All of this to say, that this short interview that Jeff gave in October of 2012 started a snowball rolling that brought up serious questions about journalistic integrity, the role of games media within the games industry itself, and whether or not this level of commercial involvement was healthy for the industry. As a result, he received the title, The Dorito Pope, and the meme was born. To this day, Jeff blocks people on Twitter if they send him a copy of this meme. I of course, wouldn't know firsthand because I definitely wouldn't have made a dummy account to test this out, but I've heard that this happens. <laughs> But in large part, Jeff seems to have moved on from the controversy, even though the ripples of it are still felt today. He no longer calls himself a journalist openly, at least very rarely does he do so, and most of the gaming quote-unquote journalists that were caught up in the scandal as well have moved away from the title, instead simply calling themselves avid gamers and streamers, because when you're labeled a streamer, you can get away with pretty much anything. My rhymes are fly, my beats are sick, my crew is big and it keeps getting bigger. That's cause Jesus Christ is pasty little cracker bits in my chat. And the ripples of this event are felt elsewhere as well. The Cyberpunk 2077 debacle brought to mind many of the same issues that were raised back in 2012. People who claimed to be unbiased gaming journalists and media figures received merchandise, privileged access to game previews, and in some cases even referred to the game as quote unquote, their dream game after playing it in its extremely buggy and broken state. This has lived up to be sort of a game of my dreams. It really showed what a lot of these so-called journalists were made of. Just like Jeff, they weren't interested in critically evaluating the product at hand. They were primarily interested in retaining the relationships that gave them access to cool swag and early access to highly anticipated games. Again, I don't have an issue with people taking sponsorships and making a living that way. As I said, I do it myself and will do it later in this video. But I draw the line when it comes to a product that my audience expects me to evaluate critically. If you guys want me to critique a game like God of War Ragnarok, I would consider it inappropriate to make countless videos hyping up the game, showing off swag I had received from Sony, and refusing to criticize any aspect of it for fear of losing access to that special treatment. 
I won't name any names, but I myself have been removed from the list for review codes and swag by several large publishers who I have criticized over the last few years for what I considered to be corrupt and evil business practices. But I still said that, and I stand by those statements, even though my access to their goodies was revoked as a result. And even when I do receive swag, it doesn't prevent me from criticizing the product at the end of the day, because I can separate the two. Ubisoft sent me tons of swag for Assassin's Creed Valhalla, which I appreciated, but I still called that game an absolute travesty. If you want to hear my extended ass ripping of that game, check out my three hour video explaining why it's terrible. And of course, there were some people with Cyberpunk who received swag and still maintained a level head. I'm not going to say that everybody was corrupted by the swag, but I am telling you as somebody that is active in this industry who gets swag from certain companies and has faced the consequences of criticizing companies after receiving said swag, it's a corrupting force. And it's something that people who are claiming are level headed and fair just shouldn't be messing with. Listen, even though the Dorito Pope incident was back in 2012, the issues that it encapsulated are still present in the industry today. Even at the Game Awards 2021 that Jeff Keighley himself put on that actually inspired this video, it was clear that the award show was still just about Jeff Keighley getting to meet famous people, making money from large corporate sponsors, and being the center of attention, even though he has the stage presence of a decorative autumn squash. Even in situations where he should clearly step aside and let others into the spotlight, he insists on being ever present, even if it will result in a worse experience for the audience, such as the 2019 panel with Elon Musk and Todd Howard. I was in the audience for this, watching live in LA. And just before this panel, Troy Baker had run a discussion that was fantastically well organized. He kept the conversation moving, asked interesting questions, and his stage presence carried the whole thing through even when there were awkward breaks and pauses. The Elon Musk and Todd Howard interview, on the other hand, was one of the most cringeworthy things of the entire conference. Partially because Todd is very awkward, Elon is very awkward, and because Jeff doesn't know how to sit still without looking like an alien trying really hard to convince you that it's a person. All I'm saying is if Jeff were actually concerned with the best panel possible, he would have had Troy Baker direct and supervise this panel with Elon and Todd. But because he wanted the chance to meet Elon Musk and Todd Howard, he insisted on doing it himself, even though it actively detracted from the quality of the panel. Listen, the industry will only improve if we hold these people's feet to the fire and demand better. And that's what I'm asking you to do with everybody in a position of authority and influence in this industry, including myself. You need to hold me accountable along with everybody else that makes videos, that streams, and talks about video games. Together, we can build a healthier, safer, and better industry free from the alleged perverts, free from the alleged corporate sycophants, and free from the losers. And to that's it for me. Thank you for watching this video. If you have any thoughts, please leave them in the comment section below. I would love to hear them. Also, make sure to follow me on Twitch so you know when I'm going live. But with that, I love you all. I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.